Welcome to episode number 354 of Grid Talk. Today we're here to preview the season-ending 2023 Abu Dhabi Grand Prix. My name is George Harrison, and joining me today we have Grid Talk co-host Owen Medford. Hello. And Sophia Richmond. Hi. And host of the DNF1 podcast, Adam Burns. Hello. But before we get into the episode, we must thank our sponsor for the episode, Bet Online. Bet Online is your number one source for all your betting needs. Get the latest odds, lines, and match reports for baseball, boxing, golf, and more. Bet Online continues to be the fastest and easiest way to pl- place your wages, including live betting and your favorite casino and card games, available to play right now from your phone. Head to the website or use your mobile device to sign up today and get in on the action. Remember to use the promo code BELIEVE, that's B L E A V, for your 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. Bet online, where the game starts. And today, Sophia, we are going to start with Haas, who are still bottom of the Constructors Championship. They still have they still have something to fight for, and that they're in a battle with Alpha Tauri and, and the other team down there that I've just forgotten the name of. <laughs> As well, yeah, there's a battle going on for eighth, obviously trying to avoid some embarrassment there. They did potentially show some better form in Las Vegas, but still no point. Is there any hope heading into Abu Dhabi that they might be able to get off the bottom of that Constructors' Championship? Yeah, they're only four points off from Alfa Romeo, which is the other team <laughs> talking <That's> about. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's just more so damage limitations. I, you can put it said a few times that they don't really care about 2023 now. Obviously, the main focus is coming into next year. Looking back to Las Vegas, uh, qualifying, they had some decent times on it, even though with Nico Hulkenberg not finishing the race and Kevin pretty much lacking the pace the pace to get points. I think it's just more they're just going to try to keep straight and just not put a foot wrong. It'll be interesting as well because Oli Behrman is taking the last seat. So he's replacing Nico Hulkenberg in FP1, so that's obviously one less time Nico will have on the track. So... It'll be interesting to see. I think it is a close battle with Alfa Romeo and Alfa Tori as well, as mentioned, but I don't see them progressing from that bottom. I think they're going to finish the season in 10th. Yeah, I think it's looking likely. And apologies for forgetting the the name of the other one there. I was just thinking of Alfa, and of course, they're both Alfa, one for PH and one for Neff. But yeah, Haas on 12 at the moment, Alfa Romeo on 16, Alfa Tauri on 21, and Williams as well above them on 28. I think Williams are probably going to be relatively safe. We'll talk about them in a bit. But but yeah, Haas really not having an amazing end to the season. Alfa Romeo, Adam, there was potentially some more pace in the car, but Alfa Bottas qualifying 7th in Las Vegas, but finishing finished the last finisher in 17th there. Obviously, that car can show some pace in qualifying, but over the race distance, it's not looking particularly great. Again, same question to you. Is there any hope of them really catching the other Alpha Tauri and other Alpha team and battling for eighth in that Constructors' Championship? As Sophia said, it's not a large gap at all between the two teams. I mean, we're talking five points, but five points to a team like Alfa Romeo, we're talking potentially a quarter of their total points for the season. So it's a huge ask for them to be able to do that. As Sophia said, I-, I think it would be nice for them to try and finish an extra place in the Constructors' Championship. And that prize money revenue is uh, oh so lucrative to a team like that that's currently going for a transition. Of course, it would just be Sauber um, next season. And it's hard to say, to be honest. So we know at the last race of the season, some people tend to switch off or their priorities go elsewhere. It may provide an opportunity in a crazy race like we saw in Vegas, where perhaps we might see Alpha get some points. I feel for Valtteri more in this instance because I think the big chance to get some points passed him by almost immediately after the start in after such a good qualified performance which even then wasn't looking fantastic relatively speaking because he was still behind two Williamses so P7 didn't exactly look great as much as it would love to be P7 part of me was fi- feeling sorry for Valtteri so much bad luck he's had this season and I think it pretty much was edified by this one moment where you know Fernando Alonso had that spin at turn one and you could almost hear the team radio from Valtteri. It was a bit like Cleveland from Family Guy, where he's just slowly approaching the Aston Martin going, no, and all jokes aside. And you could really feel for Valtteri. It, it sums up how Alpha season's gone. If they manage to do it, George, then fantastic for them. There's some extra prize money in the kitty. But I'd be very surprised if Alfa Romeo were going to beat Alpha Tauri. I think it's more likely that we'll see Haas potentially threaten them as unlikely as that seems as well. But you never know. This is Formula 1. One race to go, you never know. 
anything can happen and it usually does that's formula one so you never know there's always a chance there's always a chance and yeah so from one alpha to the other alpha alpha tauri there's a little there's a little bit of a gap I, I it's actually closer than i thought it was between them and then williams in seventh it's probably a big ask to see them really threaten williams especially with how good williams were in qualifying in las vegas admittedly no points in the race we'll talk about them very soon but at the same time Owen, the the result from Mexico, that freak result from Daniel Ricciardo, has to be giving the Williams people a bit of sleepless night. It's, it can can we see a repeat of that potentially in Abu Dhabi this weekend? I'm going to go with no, George. You can look at the stats. I'll put it this way: Alpha Tauri have to outscore Williams by seven points, which is thirty percent, three percent of what they've taken over the season so far, and that includes that freak result that they got in Mexico. I don't think Alpha Tauri is capable of scoring seven points. End end of sentence. I don't think that's going to happen. They had a fairly decent race, and there were times during Vegas where they were doing fairly well. But there's, there is, I'm going to put it right here, right now. There is no way Alpha Tauri get out of seventh in the constructor. Uh, sorry, get to seventh in the constructors. It's just not going to happen. I don't think I, I, this is taking out, even not looking at the car, where I think the strengths of the Williams are in Abu Dhabi in comparison to the Alpha Tauri. I don't, I don't see any route forward for them. Uh, and like I say, I think the gap is far too large, and they would they'd need to score seven points, let alone outscore by seven points. I think that's uh, I think it's unattainable. They're not worrying for money. I think they'll be one of the teams that switch off. To be perfectly honest, I think uh, this is essentially they they could almost may as well not turn up. Don't go making brave bets on this podcast, Wayne. You know what the, the consequences of those can I don't be. Put stake, I don't put stakes on my bets. I've seen what happens to you guys. I'm not for it. <laughs> yeah, we've obviously got one, one race to go. And uh, yeah, if, if Sergio Perez doesn't win it, then we all know what happens to me. But if he does somehow win it, we know what happens to Tom Horrocks. But we'll see. But I do take your point. Absolutely. It is unlikely from that point of view. I think it's a miracle that Alfa Tauri actually managed to get up to eighth because they looked dead and buried in that 10th place for the absolute vast majority of the season and had a freak few results and they've managed to get to eighth. I think that is a rousing success story given how poor they were at the mid-season break, really. But yeah, so moving on, we'll speak about Williams next, Sophia. Like I mentioned, they had an amazing qualifying in Las Vegas, but the race was just not there. I suppose it'll probably go down for a missed opportunity, but like Wayne was saying as well, it's unlikely to really bite them. Obviously, miles behind LP, no hope of catching them, but they're probably safe behind as well, given how few points those final four teams are really fighting for. Yeah, I like to say the the top of the bottom hat, like bottom of the constructors, I pretty much but they were close of scoring points as you mentioned qualifying they are really good in the cooler weathers we've seen that in other circuits as well and obviously they are very powerful on the straights which does come into play in Abu Dhabi because you do have the long straights going from five to six um turns five and six so it is possible I think Williams can do quite well when it comes to qualifying when it comes to the actual race on the Sunday I think it's going to be another repeat of how Las Vegas will be I think it's just not all there. They've just not hooked up the car. Similar to how Ferrari is. They are very good maybe in qualifying, but then when it comes to the actual race, drop down the pace. Another, and I'm going to say this for pretty much whoever I'm speaking about, you got Zach O'Sullivan, who will be taking uh, free practice as well for replacing Alex Albon for the rookie seat as well. So it'll be quite interesting to see. Looking at last year as well, Alex didn't have the best season, best race in Abu Dhabi last year. But Logan actually has done quite well looking back at his record in Formula 2 and in Formula 3 at the circuit. He finished P5 and P6s in both the races last year. So hopefully that can maybe transfer into the F1 race. But again, very similar to Haas, it'll be damage limitations. Try not to put a foot wrong. Try maybe to score a point. I think that might be a bold prediction to get at least a point for Williams to secure the gap even more by eight points instead of seven. Um... But we'll see. I think we'll see how the straights are for them. But I'm expecting a good qualifying, but not a really good race for them. Yeah, I could certainly see that. And uh, like you mentioned about the cold conditions in Las Vegas, relatively cold. Everybody was freaking out about highs of 20 degrees in the day and lows of about 10. And I'm just like, that's like summer for us in the UK. But obviously, Formula One, that is freezing. That's not going to be a problem this weekend, though, as despite it being almost into December now, I'm just looking at the forecast, we're talking high 20s and mid 20s uh, for the whole weekend in Abu Dhabi this weekend so it's not going to be cold it's definitely not going to be cold but those long straights obviously Abu Dhabi had a revamp th- two three years ago now 
it's a lot faster. It's a lot more free flowing. So that circuit configuration will suit the Williams more, but will he suit them enough? He's probably asking quite a bit. I tell you what though, a team that could definitely be, some people might thought, oh, they've switched off. They're not really bothering about next year. They're in no man's land. That's Alpine. However, very good result for them. Ocon ended up in fourth place in Las Vegas, really higher than anybody thought he'd get to, especially since he started about 16th, I think. So, Adam, what are you expecting from Alpine this weekend? Is it the, the last half of this season really has just been full of free hits for them? They can just do whatever, they can try whatever, and just build for next year. But the, they'll be hoping to carry this momentum into 2024. That's been the story of Alpine. It's always been this 100 race plan that they always revise the deadline or when that starts from, pretending that we've completely forgot about what has proceeded before that and the absolute failures that they keep repeating again and again. And just for reference, I'm talking about Alpine. People might get confused thinking I'm talking about Ferrari here when I mention that. But in in regards to Alpine, we've seen this over and over again with them. Do they really have the foot off the gas pedal? Are they focusing on next year? They're always promising something big. Bruno Famine, after taking over from Otmar Schaffner early in the season when he was fired, and they had that huge reshuffle uh, at Alpine where Lauren Rossi is now working on some kind of special project. God only knows what that entails. We still don't really know what this identity of this Alpine team is going to be. That all being said, the one joy that we've had from Alpine this season has been the story of Ocon and Gasly, which admittedly has gone under the radar for some time this season. I think we all expected fireworks. I don't think it got more chaotic than what we saw at Melbourne when the two of them came together and they lost a big result there. Obviously, at that point in the season, there seemed to be much more on the line. Fast forward to the end of this season, and I would say the relationship between the two has been rather amicable, rather a civil, if you like, compared to what we were expecting with their history. That being said, we saw a little bit of a teaser of what I think we're going to get from these two this weekend at the Vegas Grand Prix when they were fighting each other. And obviously, we referenced Ocon's brilliant performance on the Sunday, keeping it all together, staying out of trouble, and ended up P4 from a dismal qualifying position. Gasly's weekend went the other way, and it was really affected by that safety car, which really pushed him down. So coming to this weekend... Gasly is now only four points ahead of his teammate, and I'm pretty certain there's nothing more that Esteban Ocon would want than to get one up on his teammate and beat him at the end of the season, because those bragging rights are going to be huge at Alpine over the winter break. So I'm very much looking forward to seeing what those two do, and one thing I can certainly guarantee, team orders are not going to be received at all by either of them this weekend, so that's going to be one to keep an eye on. Yeah, their, their radios may mysteriously malfunction for a few minutes while they're trying to get that message across. But then again, maybe I'm just being a cynic. But, uh, yeah. Evan Butler syndrome, perhaps, maybe. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, mate. Didn't, didn't quite catch that with a French accent, obviously, because they wouldn't sound like that. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Why not? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, no, it, it, I didn't realise it was actually quite that close to the, the two Alpine drivers. There was a big gap between those two earlier in the season, so for it to be so close is, is something special indeed. And speaking of close, actually, surprisingly close anyway, the battle between Aston Martin and McLaren. And um, We're going to focus on Aston Martin first, Owain. I, I thought as soon as McLaren, and I was hoping as a McLaren fan, as soon as they got ahead, they were just romped away, and that was it. The battle's over. Aston Martin are terrible at the moment. McLaren are like the second best team on pace. But ever since that's happened, in typical McLaren fashion, it's flipped. Aston Martin, out of nowhere, Lance Stroll with back-to-back fifth-place finishes as well. From 19th on the grid in Las Vegas, nobody saw that coming. I don't even think he in the wildest of a dream would have seen that coming. Aston Martin, obviously, a real revival with that. How do you see them getting on this weekend? Because they found some pace in that car. And I think you actually said it earlier on in a previous podcast. I don't even think they know where this pace has come from. I don't think they're going to care either. They've gone from, they had this massive downtick in form in the last, probably, what, four races. And we were sitting there going, they really look like they're out of touch. And now they're right back in it. They're within touching distance. They're 11 points away. It's one of those things where, you know, as you say, Stroll finished fifth. That got, yeah, Stroll finished fifth. That got them an extra 10 points. It, it's entirely possible now that they can steal fourth from out of the nose, from under the nose of, of McLaren. And, and I'm here for it, I'll be honest. I hope maybe it's just, I hope this doesn't peter out because we could this could turn into sort of a massive battle. And I think McLaren really didn't give themselves any favours in Las Vegas, but honestly, it's it, it's going to set up to be I think probably one of the finishes of the season here. We're now above the Alpine 
fulcrum point of the of the teams and 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 now we're into the part where he starts to get properly competitive this is now a race of two and i can't wait to see how it plays out i I genuinely think aston martin could grab this from uh, from mclaren there's definitely a chance i begrudgingly admit there's definitely a chance there Uh, especially with the form of the two teams i I think mclaren have been a little unfortunate at times but at the same time aston martin have took the chances and it's not a big gap at all 11 points when you're fighting at the top so that's the less than the amount of points you should get for fourth by itself. So there's definitely a chance there for Aston Martin to sneak in. But Sophia, can McLaren hold on? Can they rescue this? They make they're making us all sweat. They're making us all worry with this. There is some serious pace in that car, but they've just not shown it for some reason in the last few rounds. But can Abu Dhabi change that? God, I hope so. I have a bet on <laughs> McLaren to finish up above Aston Martin. So I hope that no financial, just a pint with mates. But I still stand by that bet as a not so secret McLaren fan myself. Anyway, it was a big reality check last weekend in Las Vegas, both for, for both drivers, to be fair. Both of them being knocked out of Q1. Nobody expected that. Bad strategy calls. And then, fortunately, with Lando now being passed and he's safe to drive for Abu Dhabi, I think it now sets the tone up. We need to make a comeback because even with the upgrades, they came out of nowhere. They were so down and then they've been outperformed. They've scored so many points the second half of the season. I think they will finish on a high. As Owen said, it's going to go down to the wire between Aston Martin and McLaren. But I think because McLaren, even though the last couple races have not been as consistently getting the points, because they have both of their drivers consistently... In the points where it's like Aston Martin, it's been very like only Alonso and then Stroll just popped up wildly every once in a while. I think the consistency of both of the drivers from McLaren will make the big difference for them to finish above Aston Martin. It'll be interesting to see. Looking back at last week as well, Lando had the highest, second highest streak of race finishing behind Verstappen as well. So they are quite good and it'll be surprising to see. And again, as mentioned, we have Pato Award that will be taking Lando's spot, though, in FP1. So it'll be interesting to see that gives Lando an extra day to recover before getting ready for FP2. I'm expecting a lot. I would like to see both of them in the points. I think that's not unrealistic for both of the drivers. I think maybe not both of them into Q3. I think maybe one will be into Q3 and then one into Q2. I won't say which, but I think that's like the more realistic goal and then we'll make a point in the race because the like, opposite where they have been fast in qualifying but then also like they have a good race pace as well so we'll see but i'm hoping for double points to finish off the rest of the season for mclaren let's hope so let's hope so and we've been here the entire time to cover it obviously the entire 2023 season coming to an end now but yeah we've been here from the start of the season uh, where i was dead i was so disappointed with mclaren how bad they were doing and now to see them transform into this it's just yeah and then Aston Martin comes out of nowhere to find some pace to make it interesting in the final round. And if you're in, if you guys are enjoying this podcast as much as I'm enjoying the battle, the battles between the constructors this season, uh, we'd love it if you leave us a five star review on Spotify or an Apple Podcast. Uh, the, it does really help us out with the rankings with that. And if you're one of the 72 percent of people who aren't yet subscribed to the YouTube channel, head over to the YouTube channel and give us a like and subscribe on there. Very much appreciated. Most episodes are recorded live after the event itself. This is not one of them. This is a preview show. But yeah, we do go out, out there about an hour or so after the qualifying in the race. That'll be 4 p.m. UK time, Saturday and Sunday for this weekend's Abu Dhabi Grand Prix. We move on to the other constructors battle going on, which is even tighter, Adam. Just four points between Ferrari and Mercedes. Ferrari, the team in better form at the moment in the ascendancy. You as a Ferrari fan, are you excited heading into Abu Dhabi? Do you think your guys can do it this weekend? As a Ferrari fan, and I'm sure the drivers would might attest to this as well, and anyone associated with Ferrari, I don't think anyone is overly thrilled about this being a battle for P2. They'd much rather be fighting for a world championship. But as cliche as that sounds. That being said, I am very much looking forward to this, George. And I do have hope that Ferrari can get the job done. As you rightly said, that the form has been very much in Ferrari's favour in recent weeks. I will say that Ferrari have been incredibly unlucky over the last few races for different reasons, of course. But of Vegas, we saw what went down there. I'm not going to get too much into the nitty gritty with Carlos Sainz and and what happened there because you guys would have covered that already. And and we all know why it didn't go the way they would have wanted because there would have been a legal challenge and all that stuff. With Charles Leclerc, I 
am adamant that he should have won in Vegas. If it wasn't for that second safety car, he wouldn't have just won that race. He probably would have won it with a reasonable margin. But as it was, the safety car happened. Max Verstappen does what Max Verstappen does and gets the W. And that's just a testament to how great he was. Coming into this race, though, Leclerc's in very good form. Signs his form. He's, he's always been consistent throughout this season. So I think Ferrari's their drivers are, are doing what they need to be doing at the right time. And the car seems to be in a relative good balance at this point in time where they could look at potentially getting the job done over Mercedes. What they certainly will hope for this weekend is the car to be strong at this track. Pr- probably won't be as strong as it was in Vegas regular to the, uh, relative to the competition, but I think it might be a bit better than it was at Brazil for that instance as well, somewhere along the middle. Where that puts him in the pecking order, I'm not sure. I think McLaren may end up being Red Bull's biggest challenger this weekend just because of the characteristics of the updated Abu Dhabi layout compared to what it used to be, which I think would have suited Ferrari a bit better. But then when you look at Mercedes, the one thing that they have that has been a trump car for them all season, Lewis Hamilton. And despite Vegas being a one-off, less than incredible race for him, although he was quite unfortunate too, I'm very much expecting him to be the decisive factor in all of this. I think if Ferrari are going to get this job done, I think it's going to matter where Lewis Hamilton is in all of this. If Lewis does what Lewis does best, then I think Mercedes will get it over the line. If not, I think it will be Ferrari's to lose, but it could go either way. Yeah, it's a really tight battle. And I've done a video that will be out very shortly on our social channels at Grid Talk UK. If you're not following us on there, it's a short video just going over the the many battles in the constructors. Obviously, the the drivers and the constructors championships have been wrapped up for quite some time now. But there's, as we've covered in this show, there's three big tussles all up and down the championship that are yet to be resolved. Now, obviously, so we've heard from Adam, who's a Ferrari fan, except for Wayne. What are you thinking for Mercedes? Are you confident heading into this week? I know you're looking through, looking, peering through fingers like that, just <laughs> trying to see what's happened to, the, to your boys. Because at the end of the day, I think Russell did cross the line fourth, but seventh and eighth in Las Vegas, not exactly confidence inspiring. But historically, this has been a track with some severe heartache for Hamilton. However, again, like Adam mentioned as well, he has been very good at times this season and as i think he's got the joint most wins here with four he's a it's a good circuit for him down the years yeah i think mercedes know how to win here that's you know fairly evident um and obviously you've got ex- lewis Hamilton being an experienced person a spirits racer he knows exactly how to manage a race and uh, mercedes generally don't tend to slip up um i think the biggest thing though is that they just I think they've pulled their foot off the gas a little bit or maybe they're not understanding the car or they say they have at times and they understand where the issues were that caused that down to conform but it's just I, th- I think it's now just a, it's getting to squeaky bum time it's just it's really close and I'm not sure I can guarantee that Mercedes are going to pull this out of the bag a couple of years ago I said easily because Ferrari had seemed to implode at every opportunity Mercedes even such a slick operation it, it seemed impossible that they'd mess it, things up even if they did have a bad bad setup or poor qualifying or anything like that I think the improved layout means that if, if Mercedes do have a bad qualifying or something like that they'll be able to make that up but I think in the meantime Ferrari are going to be romping away into the distance I think essentially Mercedes need to really watch out hit the ground running and make full use of the three practice sessions that they you know <laughs> that they've come to miss at this point and and void a repeat of Vegas because it wasn't an amazingly good race for them and it was back to where they were at the start of the year I think the only only saving grace in that respect is maybe Mercedes have gone we can happily finish third in the constructors that that has we can lose the money but we can gain a bit of aero time back and 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 make set and make use of that instead I don't think that's any I'm not sure that's a worry for them at all but I don't see them going out and doing it but they're gonna have to watch themselves because it's Ferrari are right there they're literally right there (laughs) <laughs> they are right there. And I think if we have a repeat of the result that we had in Vegas, Ferrari would have to take Mercedes. Let's see what happens. It is a title battle that I'm very fascinated to see that. And that's part of the beauty of the pecking order. Even You can even throw Red Bull in there in certain races. This did it, they, Yeah, obviously, Verstappen's been winning so much, of course. But there have been times when Ferrari have been up with there with them, or McLaren have been up there with them, or Mercedes have been up there with them. And then you throw in a wild Alpine that just shows up every now and again. And Aston Martin at the start of the season. People say that the season's been boring. And yeah, you could argue that the... Sorry. It's not an argument. It's a fact that the battle at the top of the championship hasn't been close. But there's a lot of battles further down there. But the biggest question, the biggest battle, the biggest thing on the line this weekend, Sophia, 
Who's wearing the sombrero? Can Sergio Perez do it this weekend? No. <laughs> I am sorry. Can't I'm, say that. Come I'm on. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I think if you look at like the stats and how it's been, yes, obviously Perez got was able to finish the driver's championship in P2, a historic one two for Red Bull, which has never happened. However, this is Perez's first podium since Monza. And as well, he has lost a place on the final lap to back races as well. That is unheard of. He could be in P1 and then Max will come and then on the last lap, Perez will lose it, make it three in a row. That could happen. Pro- probably won't happen because of how Max is and how good he has been driving. But I think it, it is Red Bulls. Obviously, we had Mercedes dominate Abu Dhabi for years and now it's Red Bulls turn into it. I think that's a consistent thing. Pretty much as well, Max Verstappen has had a trophy in every single race minus Singapore. So it is a given that he will get a podium. Whether that's the top step or not, more likely than one, it will be the top step. And also, it's just stats in general. He's just winning it this season, which goes back to your case about how it's boring this season because the top spot for both the constructors and the drivers was settled. But there were still some good battles. I was hoping it would go to Abu Dhabi between Lewis and um, Perez for the second place because obviously all the rumors about Perez, if he doesn't get P2 in the drivers, he's going to lose his seat, who's going to take over. So that's all done in saddle now. But now it's just, Red Bull's just going to leave and just probably just run away with it like they always do. Interesting enough, and that, again, every time, both drivers will not be taking place in free practice because they are the only team that has not raced any rookie of some sort in previous races. So Isaac Hajar, who was with Alvatore in Mexico, he'll be replacing, I believe, Max's seat. And formerly E-champion Jake Dennis will be taking over Perez's seat. So that'd be quite interesting to see Max or like not seeing Max or Checo racing in the FP1. So it'd be quite interesting to see how these two drivers with the different disciplines that they come from actually do in uh, free practice. It's probably just going to be a reconnaissance data gathering more than anything else, but it'll be interesting to see. I'm expecting just a win for Red Bull. It- it's a given. It's always been the case, I think, this season, and we've said it multiple times throughout this entire season on Grid Talk that Max is just on a whole different level, absolute masterclass performance. The fact that he dropped down to like fifth at one point in Las Vegas and then won as well. He's won from different positions of the grid this season so far. He has the record for the most like wins in the season. So, yeah, I'm excited to see the rest of the battles. I think that's where most of my focus will be for this weekend coming. Yeah, it, it is rather ominous for, <laughs> for myself, really, when it comes to that bet because, yeah, the Staffton's just been on another level. As we keep saying all the time, it's just... I, I Like I said, when Hamilton was dominating the sport when we started the show years ago... It's just a perfect combination of team, car, driver, circumstances, tires, engine. Every every part of that car is just on another level. Despite the sanctions they obviously faced from breaking the cost cap a couple of years ago, it doesn't seem to have affected them. They've just pulled out a ridiculous gap to the rest of the field. Obviously, it's not over till it's over, but I'm not feeling confident. I'll put it that way. (laughs) Not because Perez has been particularly bad recently. I think he's had a real resurgence recently, but still, even then, you're talking about Max Verstappen. You could say what you want about the guy. He's a great champion. He is an unbelievable driver. The pace he gets out of that car is something else. There's just nothing that comes close to it right now. There really isn't. But yeah, so those are the 20 teams. and Sorry, the, tw- the 10 teams and the 20 plus drivers. We mentioned quite a few free practice drivers. Sophia, thank you for filling those, isn't it, on those as always with that. But yeah, we're going to get into our predictions now. I'll start with you, Adam. Let's go with let's go with pole, top three, and a pole prediction, please. Oh, so pole position. Uh, I think you've got to look no further than probably Max Verstappen. If I'm honest, I mean, I'd love to say Charles Leclerc, but I think this is going to be a track that won't suit Ferrari as well as some others have. So I'd stick with Max. Top three, yeah, Max. Uh, I'm going to say Lando Norris because I think McLaren are going to be much stronger this weekend. I think this circuit will suit their strengths. And P3, I will probably. It's a tough one for P3, but I will say Oscar Piastri. I'm gonna go, and that's gonna be my bold one, P3 for Oscar, if that is permissible. Because as good as McLaren, I think that will be this weekend. I think Oscar was brilliant in Vegas. Unfortunately, the strategy he was on meant that he had to drop from P4 all the way down 
almost out of the points until he recovered because he couldn't complete the strategy he was on to a hard so he had to go to the mediums so that will be my bold prediction and um, if i may i did mention in the chat that i did an, an interesting stat for max verstappen this season so max verstappen at the moment is currently on the third longest winning streak in f1 history he also achieved the longest winning streak in f1 history for race wins in the same season that just shows how dominant that guy has been this year to have done two of those in the same year is ridiculous yeah, the uh, <laughs> it's just unprecedented, isn't it? It's typical that I make this kind of wager and then the guy goes on the biggest winning streak in their streak and then the third biggest winning streak in history of the same season. <laughs> oh, honestly, like like we said, yeah, it's yeah, it's looking like it's heading one way. Oh, Wayne, what are your predictions? Top three, bold and pole. I'm gonna have to go with pole from. Yeah, actually, no, I'm not. I'm gonna go with pole for Carlos Sainz. I think the Ferraris are one lap car. That's why we've seen them perform so poorly all season. I think they can take the pole. I think they'll try and get that, and they'll try and finally manage their way to the completion and get and, and just get it over the line for the checkered flag to deny Red Bull from being the uh, from being the most dominant car in history. No, I don't think anyone else is going to win a race if it's, if it's going to be one of these two. Uh, sorry, if it's going to be a, a race winner, it's going to be one of the four uh, one of the four drivers for Red Bull and Ferrari but I think it's going to be Max Verstappen the guy doesn't let up he doesn't stop he will bring Red Bull over to up to the to have the RB19 be the most dominant car of all time yes I looked that stat up it'll be 95.4% which is obviously over the MP4 uh, 93.8 I think second place it's you know what I'm going to go second place as Checo as well finally he'll get his act together I reckon but just you know what re replicating the result that he should have been replicating all season uh, and yet hasn't <laughs> for for various reasons and I think the third place is again is going to be Carlos Sainz I think my bold prediction you know what my bold prediction has to be that Alpha Tauri gets seventh that's it despite what you said earlier in the show no chance of happening it's consider now cons not that they care consider the gauntlet thrown down <laughs> oh we get all kinds of opinions here on the grid talk podcast contrasting and argumentative opinions sometimes against ourselves that's just how we roll here sophia what are your predictions for the weekend not gonna lie i think i was gonna have a contrasting one as well potentially saying that max is gonna win but i think charles will take pole I think he will finally convert the poll to a win to close out the season, which again contradicts to what I just said about Red Bull going to win Abu Dhabi. Why not? Let's finish off it with a weird... Try to break the curse of Charles's poll to not win conversion. I think that P2 will be Max and P3, because I am a McLaren fan, I would love to see Lando back up onto the podium for the final race of the season. And I think, I, I hate to say, but that is my bold, is the pull to win conversion because it's going on for such a long time this season. And it, it makes sense because we've seen it time after time this season and even previous seasons as well, where Charles has taken pole. But yeah, he just doesn't win. I don't know. Obviously, we've said that Ferrari just lacks the race pace as well. And I think maybe they might actually finally put their heads together and actually put a good strategy and a good setup for the car, unlikely. Who knows? Maybe because it's <laughs> the last race of the season. By miracle, they're going to actually do well. So we'll see for that. We'll see for that indeed. You've not gone with a Red Bull win, but I am. Sergio Perez is going to win. I'm manifesting it. I'm going to hopefully make it happen. I don't see it happening, but I'm going to say it's happening. Second place, I don't even... It don't really matter at this point. Let, let's just put Verstappen in there just because him not being him not winning is a bold prediction in itself, I think. And third place, I've got to stick with my boys. I'm going to put Lando on the podium as well. Yeah. And Adam has just put a very interesting stat, which I think that's that is beyond belief almost. Do you want do you want to read it out? Uh, yeah, sure. And obviously this isn't including the the anthem before the race starts. Obviously someone's going to get in the comments and go, oh, wow, what about Silverstone for an example? But that doesn't count. So if a British team or driver doesn't win this weekend, it will be the first season since 1952 where the British national anthem has not been played on any podium during the F1 season. Now, that's a crazy stat in its own right. People are going to say, oh, it makes a nice change of pace, although they get bored of the Dutch national anthem. But the Austrian national anthem has been played more times than the Dutch one this season. 
nobody seems to be complaining about that one. We have heard the best national anthem, in my opinion, at least this season on the F1 podium, being the Italian anthem for Carlos Sanz in, in, in Singapore, which I absolutely love. That is a, that is a belter of a national anthem. Mm. Um, the Spanish one's not bad either. It's my favourite karaoke song because it's got no lyrics, so it's brilliant. Free to use that one at Christmas if you want, George. I am a dad, so I might as well use a dad joke like that. Absolutely. And if you want to hear more from more dad jokes from Adam, where can you head? Oh, we'll head over to the DNF1 podcast. We've got dad jokes galore. Sometimes an F1 <laughs> podcast breaks out as well. But like you guys do at uh, Grid Talk and F1 Chronicle, of course, we do our podcast on previews and race reviews as well. We don't do live streams, but the next best thing, of course, for your Monday morning commutes, we have our reviews out. Look to see you there. Yep, definitely check those guys out. I was on their podcast many moons ago as well. They were a very good show there, cover a lot of stuff. Sophia, as well, we've got plenty to cover in uh, in Formula Talk, which we're calling in tomorrow. Yep, it's the final race of the Formula 2 season. So we just released an episode last week, which was previewing the Formula 3 Macau Grand Prix that obviously took place this previous weekend. So myself and George will be recording, reviewing that and previewing Abu Dhabi to see What's going to happen? Because it's going to go down to the wire and you can listen to Formula Talk wherever you listen to Grid Talk. It's our sister show. So we are on YouTube and on all streaming platforms as well. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, Wayne, if you want to give a mention to the, the other social channels where you can find Grid Talk and everything associated with Grid Talk. Yeah, so you can find us on I think any social network where the, where the at is used. We're at Grid Talk UK. That's Threads. The, the, the social network for, social network formerly known as Twitter we're on Facebook, we're everywhere to keep up to date with Grid Talk, that's at Grid Talk UK Yeah, absolutely, and consider supporting this channel via Patreon so we can uh, get some better mics, lights and recording equipment, as I mention every time it is uh, always greatly appreciated especially as it's getting so dark here in the UK, I was working from home today and it was pitch black dark by 4 o'clock I do not like this time of year for that. But Christmas is on the way, so a bit of cheer of that. <laughs> and yeah, and make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel as well so you know when every episode is recorded, which I mentioned that Abu Dhabi's qualifying and race reviews will be live from 4pm UK time on Saturday and Sunday for both of those. And don't forget to listen to Formula Talk in the meantime as well. So we've got that review of Macau, which was absolutely manic as always, and the preview for F2 Abu Dhabi as well. And uh, yeah, thank you very much for listening to Grid Talk Podcast presented by Bet Online. Uh, goodbye.